If you've read Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe, one of the first lines is that to understand the quantum world, you need to forget everything that you think you know. I love this line because it really hammers home the message of just how weird quantum mechanics is. For example, if I were to throw a rock at your head, at no point would you expect it to diffract around you like a wave in a lake. You'd simply expect it to hurt. But on the smallest scales, the rules of what's a solid piece of matter and what's a wave blur together in what's known as the wave-particle duality. When science was still young and new, it was assumed that the smallest units of matter were all particles. In many cases, things could be modeled this way and it made the math really straightforward. Point-like particles could be modeled, as could their motion and the effects of their motion. But it didn't take long for scientists to find holes in that line of thinking. One of the first demonstrations of the wave-like nature of the quantum world was the famous double-slit experiment. The experiment is pretty straightforward. All we have to do is shine a light through a pair of small slits and project the result onto a screen. Before we see what happens with light, let's look at what happens if we scale this up and use a baseball instead of light. When we fire the baseball at the screen, if the trajectory lines up with the slits, it goes right through, but if it doesn't, the baseball is blocked. If we record the point of impact and repeat this a bunch of times, we end up with two areas on the screen where the ball is hitting. And for particles, this makes sense. There's no reason to think that we should expect anything else. Now, let's do the same thing, but instead of baseballs, let's do this with waves of water. As the wave propagates and reaches the slits, two mini waves are produced on the other side. These then interact as they continue their journey to the screen. In some areas, they interfere constructively and get stronger and larger. In others, they interfere destructively and get smaller and weaker. When these interfering waves strike the screen, instead of two spots like what we got with the baseballs, we get a very distinct pattern of lines called an interference pattern. Okay, now we know what happens if we use particles and waves, let's see what happens if we use light. To really make this clear, I won't be using an animation, instead let's actually perform the experiment. To do that, we're going to need a double slit. If you live in the States, you can just buy a pre-made set on Amazon, but let's pretend for a second that we're the scientists who first performed this experiment. There was no Amazon, so they had to make their own. To do this, all we need is two microscope slides and a candle. First, we need to make the slide opaque, and we're going to be using candle slit for this. Light the candle, and once it's burning, pass the microscope slide repeatedly over the fire. You don't want to hold it in one spot for too long, or the glass can get too hot and crack. Keep passing the slide back and forth until a nice layer of soot is formed. Now the hard part, actually making the double slit. I found the easiest way to do this is to use the edge of a second microscope slide and press it directly down into the soot. Try not to shake too much or your line won't be straight. Then we make a second line in the same way right next to the first. The distance between them matters a lot, so try and get it as close as possible, ideally about half a millimeter apart. When you're doing this, it's important to make sure the lines are as parallel as possible as well. It might take a few tries to get this right, and if you mess up, you can either try again a little further over, or wipe off the slide entirely and redeposit the soot. Once it's done, be extra careful not to touch the soot side, or you'll have to start again. With our double slit prepared, we can actually perform the experiment. The original scientists would have used candlelight or sunlight, but to make this easy, I'm going to cheat a bit and use a laser pointer. A laser makes this especially easy because the light is already coherent. Assuming your slide was made correctly, when we shine the laser on the slits, this is the result. You can see that the characteristic pattern of lines indicating a wave-like behavior is formed. Congratulations, you just did one of the core experiments of quantum mechanics, all with just simple candle slit. To make sure we're getting a real result, we can repeat this with the pre-made slits. Again, we get a nice diffraction pattern. One last thing you'll notice is what happens if you change out the laser that you're using. If we use a green laser instead of a red one, the lines appear closer together. You may recognize this as the same sort of effect that we saw in an earlier video on measuring Planck's constant. The shorter the wavelength, the smaller the angle of diffraction. In fact, you can actually use a double slit in place of the diffraction grading that we used in that video, and the math only changes slightly. When this result was first published, people briefly thought that this was the end of the discussion. Light is simply a wave. But that didn't last long. Thanks to Louis de Broglie, we now know that all particles have a wavelength and behave both as a wave and as a particle. This is known as the de Broglie wavelength. The way that this was proven was by repeating the experiment with electrons instead of photons. We already knew that electrons were definitely particles, and yet when the experiment was repeated, a diffraction pattern still showed up. This has now been repeated with larger and larger particles, all the way up to C80, which is a cousin of the buckyball made up of 80 carbon atoms. There are even some groups attempting to do this with entire virus particles. 
This is what is meant by the wave-particle duality. Even things that are definitely particles can still act like waves. There is a cutoff size, though. The larger a thing is, or rather, the larger something's momentum, the smaller its wavelength. This is why things like a baseball don't behave like a wave. They have too much mass and momentum to show any sort of diffraction pattern. But it gets stranger. If we slow things down and shoot individual electrons or photons, a diffraction pattern slowly builds over time. This implies that the particles are somehow interfering with themselves. The only way this is possible is if the subatomic things have both properties of a particle and a wave, but this also implies that the particle is going through both slits at the same time, which doesn't really make sense. Take a second to let that sink in and appreciate just how weird that is. And worse still, if you try and measure which slit the particle goes through, it collapses the wave function and things start behaving like simple particles and the pattern disappears. This is because to measure or observe which slit something like an electron is going through requires bouncing another particle like a photon off of it. This fundamentally changes the nature of the interaction and destroys the effect. Not everyone agrees why this happens, and to this day physicists still fight about it. I won't get into all the variations, but there are three main explanations that mathematically give the same answer, even though they're completely different. These are the Copenhagen interpretation, the many worlds interpretation, and the pilot wave interpretation. Personally, I like the pilot wave interpretation the most, but we'll have to explore these in a future video, as I think the only way to discuss them appropriately is to cover some other quantum experiments first and see why they lend credibility to one interpretation over the other. However, if you're interested, I've put some links to other great videos that explore each in the description. Okay, so now that we know that light behaves like a particle and a wave, can we actually make use of this, or is it just a fun science fact? Turns out, it's actually a really useful property. To make use of it, we're going to need to upgrade our setup and add a bunch of other components. Allow me to introduce you to a really cool device called an interferometer. We're going to be building a really simple one, but these devices are the heart of a wide array of some of the most advanced physics experiments on Earth. For example, the heart of LIGO, the device that detects gravitational waves, is an interferometer. There are a lot of different styles of interferometer, but the classic kind is called a Michelson interferometer. Instead of a double slit, it uses a pair of mirrors and a beam splitter to make the light interfere with itself. Before we get into the specifics of how this works, let's build one so that we can experiment with it. To do this, we're going to need to build an optics table. In magical, wonderful land, this would mean getting a perfectly flat metal table with holes in it that allow you to carefully line up your optics components that has a special vibration dampener to prevent anything from shaking the table. Instead of that, I'll be using a wine box and some Lego. I've put a link in the description for a far better design than what we'll be using, but I want to show how minimal this can be and still work. First, we line the bottom of the box with some Lego sheets. This will allow us to space out our components evenly and make attaching things easy. Now we need a way to hold our light source, in this case our laser point from before, in place. I found that making a simple bridge like this works well and is just the right height to both hold the laser in place and hold the button down. To mount the laser, slide it under the bridge and twist to depress the button and turn the laser on. Now we need to mount our mirrors. First, we pick a spot that's directly in the path of the laser beam as the center. Then we count out 10 bumps straight down the line from this spot. This is where our first mirror will go. As a simple holder, I used two rectangular blocks as a backing, and put a thin flat 1x4 piece in front to give a flat area to place the mirror on. Then I made two rotatable holders out of a 1x2 rectangular piece, and an inverted 1x2 angle piece. Now our mirror can be placed in the gap and secured with our holders. Don't worry about the position of the mirror yet, as we'll need to do a lot of tuning later. Now make a second mirror holder and place it 10 bumps away from the center, at a right angle from the main beam line. For your mirrors, what you ideally want is what's called a first surface mirror. This means that there's no glass between the reflective part of the mirror. However, for our crude setup, this doesn't actually matter, and I'll just be using some regular pieces of mirror. If you have some lying around, old hard drive platters work really well for this, or you can just buy first surface mirror online. Finally, we need our beam splitter, which is the heart of this device. The simplest type is what's called a 50% silvered mirror. When the laser hits this type of mirror, half of the light will go straight through, and the other half will be reflected. By placing this at a 45 degree angle to the main beam line, we can reflect half of the light at one mirror, and the other half will go through and hit the second mirror. Alternatively, we can use a beam splitter cube, which is what I ended up using. The only reason I chose this is because with this crude setup, it was easier to get it to sit flat, which makes tuning things far easier. 
If you follow the tutorial I linked in the description, you can build much better mounts for the mirrors, which would let you use a piece of 50% silvered mirror instead. Finally, the output part of the setup. We need a convex lens to spread the beam and make the output image larger. Here I'm using a small lens I had lying around, and I made a simple mount in the same sort of way as the mirror mounts to hold it in place. Before we get to tuning, let's review what we want to have happen with the light in the setup. First, it comes out of the laser and hits the beam splitter. Half of the light is reflected and strikes one mirror, and the rest goes through and hits the second mirror. Both new beams are reflected back at the beam splitter and recombined before heading towards our lens. The lens then magnifies any pattern so that we can see it. Tuning this setup means making sure that all of the beams recombine and hit the same spots, so the end mirrors are carefully adjusted to make the beams overlap on the output. This is done by carefully adjusting the mounting clips and moving the mirrors until all the dots overlap on the output. When everything is set up just right, an interference pattern shows up. It was really difficult to capture this with my camera, so I added one more mirror to reflect the output upwards so that it hits the ceiling. This makes the image much larger and the pattern easier to see. I wouldn't suggest adding this mirror until everything is lined up though, as it's harder to adjust things when looking at the larger image. The exact shape of the interference pattern is very sensitive to the alignment. Sometimes the pattern will be at an angle, sometimes it will be perfectly horizontal, and if you're using the 50% silvered mirror, you can also get concentric rings. When everything is working properly, the pattern is extremely sensitive to movement. Here I'm not even pressing on the optics table itself, but just the corner of the box, and you can see that the pattern changes. Our setup doesn't allow for it, but if the main mirrors were on sliders, any movement back and forth would also change the pattern. This leads to one of the first uses of this sort of device. By measuring how quickly the fringes move, you can measure the motion of the individual mirrors down to the nanometer. This property is used in some of the most sensitive experiments on Earth. One example of where this is used is in the calibration of the watt balance currently being used to redefine the kilogram. In a watt balance during calibration, you need to know exactly how quickly it moves up and down when a voltage is applied. So by mounting a mirror onto one of the arms and setting it up into an interferometer, you can measure its motion down to the nanometer. Another use is in extremely sensitive seismometers. Even if I was breathing too hard while close to this, it was enough to make the pattern move. Alternatively, for things like LIGO, any change to the length of the beam lines will show up in the diffraction pattern. This allows you to measure the contraction and expansion of space as a gravitational wave passes through one of the beam lines. The last use of an interferometer that I'll talk about is a special kind of spectrophotometer called a Fourier Transform Spectrophotometer. For this, there are a few changes that are made to the setup. Instead of a red or green laser like we're using, normally they use a more broad spectrum light source, usually an infrared light source. Then in the path of the output, you put a cuvette with a sample that you'd like to measure. Finally, one of the mirrors is moved back and forth and the output is measured with a special sensor. This does something kind of weird. As you're moving the mirror, it's sort of like you're panning through the infrared spectrum. So the diffraction pattern on the output is kind of like a hologram where all of that information is encoded in the diffraction pattern. So by measuring the brightness of each fringe of the diffraction pattern, you can record this hologram and all of the information. Then using a cool piece of math called a Fourier transformation, this hologram is converted into a spectrum. If you've ever used a device called an FTIR spectrophotometer, that's exactly what's going on. This can be sort of confusing, so I've put a link in the description to some more resources on the process. We've covered a lot in this video, so before I wrap up, let's review. Light and all matter can behave like a wave and a particle. This was discovered in part thanks to the famous double slit experiment. The pattern that's produced is called an interference pattern, and using a little bit of math, you can use it to measure the wavelength of the thing you're shooting through the double slit. Because light can interfere with itself, we can make use of this property by building a device called an interferometer. The diffraction pattern the device produces can be used in a variety of ways to either measure the motion of the mirrors, changes in beam length, or absorbance of light through a sample at a variety of wavelengths. I hope all of this has given you a better appreciation for just how easy it is to experiment with quantum mechanics, and also how simple fundamental properties of the universe can be used in all sorts of more complex experiments. Now that we're more and more comfortable with these sorts of experiments, we'll be able to start to explore more complex phenomena. At some point, we'll revisit this so that we can talk about those interpretations of the double slit experiment, and how some modifications to this experiment are allowing us to glimpse which of those interpretations might be correct. 
And since we're familiar with the basics of optics experiments, we may even be able to experiment with things like quantum entanglement, so be sure to check back every other Monday for all of that. If you love quantum mechanics as much as I do, then be sure to check out my store on Redbubble. I've already turned the Planck's Constant Experiment into this cool poster, and I'm already working on turning this and other videos into posters as well. If there are other designs or items you want to see added to the store, be sure to leave your suggestions in the comments down below. As always, thanks for tuning in to another Mad Science Monday. I've recently found out that YouTube has changed its subscription algorithm, so to make sure that you actually see when new videos come out, be sure to subscribe, and most importantly, click the bell icon to make sure YouTube will send you updates. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.